Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chuck McShane. I'm the Senior Vice President of Economic Research here at the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. Um, today, we want to talk about our manufacturing sector um, and, and the shifts in uh, talent acquisition and staffing in the, in the manufacturing sector in the Charlotte region and nationally. Uh, you know, the manufacturing sector contributes 15% uh, to our uh, of our region's uh, GDP. Uh, that's larger than almost any other uh, industry, about the same as finance. Uh, and more than 10% of our region is employed in manufacturing occupations. With the disruption that's happened in all industries with the COVID-19 crisis, I thought it would be a good idea to talk with some leaders in the staffing and talent acquisition industry in, our, in the Charlotte region about what they're seeing in terms of manufacturing and what they're seeing for the future in terms of manufacturing talent in, in the region and nationally. So I'd like to welcome M Michelle Fish from Integra Staffing and, and Search. Um, Herb Dew from Human Technologies, HDI. Thanks, Chuck. Dave Holtzman from Search Solution Groups. And Ron J. Sarda from Acara Solutions. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thanks, Chuck. Yeah, glad to be here. Great. So I want to start by, by thinking back slightly before the COVID-19 uh, recession really started, started to hit. And... Uh, you know, manufacturing, the, the talk about talent, the skills gap, staffing levels in, in manufacturing uh, was, a, was top of mind for a lot of folks. How has the shift in COVID-19, how has the changes um, that, have, that have come about after the coronavirus crisis, how has that changed that conversation? We can start with Michelle. Yes, um, what we saw before the corona, before COVID, is we had a lot of, actually it was a great 10 years, a great 10 year run, a lot of hourly employees, um, C-level employees, exempt employees. Um, what we're seeing now is we are seeing more and more areas in need, such as finance, supply chain, and logistics in manufacturing facilities. We're also seeing a lot of across um, uh, a lot of collaboration. So manufacturing facilities that have locations throughout the U.S., they're starting to use their engineers and their uh, exempt employees and uh, do a lot of collaboration throughout, which is causing them not to hire as many individuals as they used to need. They're not working in silos any longer. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I, I was thinking about, you know, thinking about this meeting, Chuck, I went back and looked at what was happening back in February, which, by the way, seems like ages ago. I'm sure everybody agrees. Um, and we were seeing, you know, a 3% unemployment rate and wage pressure and, you know, a negotiation on skills needed in order to get people attracted into manufacturing jobs, uh, even, even relatively simple jobs to fill. And um, I think we're going to see an opportunity, you know, this is my glasses half full outlook, but I think uh, people may move from sectors that have been really affected by this and start looking at manufacturing as we come out of this as a viable, safe opportunity to get into, get into something else other than what they're doing. So, um, you know, I, I, you know, we don't know where unemployment's going to land out of this, but, uh, but I do think that this is going to change the playing field in a positive way in the middle term, maybe not over the next 60 days, but, but after that. Well, I can add something to that. Uh, so first of all, good afternoon, Chuck, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's great to be in this panel. Uh, clearly the manufacturing sector, which kind of employs 30 million people uh, in USA is second to be hit hard after the travel and the hospitality industry and primarily, uh, what I think is for two reasons is because the nature of the job, which requires people to be on site, uh, unlike IT companies where you can have the flexibility to work remotely. And a second is also because of the slowed economy, uh, not only in the United States, but globally, uh, the, the demand for industrial products have gone down. So for me, I think those are the two major reasons why manufacturing is uh, you know, facing the burn of this pandemic. Yeah. Um, so Michelle mentioned earlier that people are moving, um, or companies are at least are thinking beyond silos uh, internally in terms of, uh, of staffing. Um, thinking across manufacturing, there's such a diversity of different types of manufacturers out there. Are there any that are 
and seeing increasing uh, demand now? Yeah, I'll jump in there, Chuck, on that one. So from what we've seen, there's quite a few areas, of course, some of the more essential companies, so to speak, anything from food, pharma, medical supplies, plastics, non-wovens, we've seen quite an uptick and increase uh, short term and then seen a long term demand there as well. What's the skill transferability look like between, say, say non-wovens or some other uh, food manufacturing? Is there is there a, um, a, the same talent pool that you're looking for there? Or are you looking for very specific skills? It's going to come down to the actual position, uh, but a lot of the roles will be somewhat interchangeable. Uh, part of it will be helping work with the clients and companies to understand that some of these skills are a little bit more interchangeable and maybe bring a little bit of flexibility on their side where when we're working with a client, if they want someone specifically from a food manufacturing background, maybe they need to be a little flexible and look at a candidate coming from something somewhat similar, but also different as well. And I think we'll see that shift. Um, and I think also we're seeing that from a lot of entrepreneurial companies, they're able to uh, make that shift with employees that don't have all the skills that they normally were looking for. I know we used to think number one was emotional intelligence, even on the line, and number two was IQ. And now everybody's going back to number one, the most important thing is finding employees that have adaptability. Number two is emotional intelligence, and number three is IQ. And I'm seeing um, hourly workers in manufacturing that they're starting to interview for those types of uh, behaviors as well. So it's not just the hard skills, it's the soft skills as well, even in, in manufacturing. Absolutely. Yes, I do think they're starting to change that, yes. You know, it's, you know it's, uh, reflecting on that, Chuck, I mean, I had a conversation with like a large, a large Southeastern company, and they asked me to come in for a discussion with them because one of the things they see an opportunity to do is really upgrade their talent mm -hmm. and bring some some employees in from other industries that would give them a different outlook, which I thought was a really cool conversation because a lot of us I know have had conversations that have stunk over the last three or four weeks with our customers, but it was fun to be involved in a conversation where somebody was looking ahead and saying, okay, even though we're automotive, you know, we'd like to target people coming out of some of these other companies that may not be as well off to, to go ahead and change it up a little bit. So I think you'll see some of that too. And uh, Chuck, just not related to manufacturing, but I've also seen, and this is something that I'm talking about a customer of mine, where I've seen people working in a retail environment and a restaurant environment and taking up job uh, as a customer care, customer care or customer service, uh, you know, because those are some of the skill sets which are really high in demand with uh, banking, finance, insurance companies. So uh, with the number of increase in call volume, so everyone's having to think more creatively now, and certainly um, manufacturing companies are having to think, think more creatively now about their entire supply chain, their entire value chain. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, we mentioned that hotels, restaurants have been hit very hard, very quickly, um, and that's dominated a lot of the conversation. But in many ways, manufacturers came early to this because they were affected by the Chinese supply chain uh, much earlier. Um, so it's been kind of a slow burn there uh, in terms of the, the uh, um, contraction of employment and, and supply chain issues in, in the manufacturing industry. Um, Ranjay, in, in particular, I'm interested in, in, in um, international supply chains and if we see manufacturers reconsidering those supply chains um, now, and if so, how do, how do you think that plays out for regions like Charlotte in terms of manufacturing growth post-COVID? So so I'm glad that you brought that point because if you look at it today, every major manufacturer uh, is now experiencing disruption in their across their supply chain of parts and uh, raw materials, and that is driven by what has now become recurring volatility of South Asian. Uh, without sounding being political, you know we can make America great again only because of manufacturing companies locally present here, and unfortunately, COVID-19 has kind of exposed the dependency of uh, manufacturing companies in the United States and their dependency on other countries for their supply chain. So I think one of the things that they have to do going forward, and this is a long run uh, plan that what we think could be uh, best effective for companies is 
coming from an international market where I have seen so far the the the, the guidelines were that India or some of the South Asian countries are supposed to do this part of the business and America is supposed to do this part of the business. And I think Michelle just mentioned about silos. I think it's time that they need to complement each other and just not depending on uh, what they are doing, but also complementing on what the other companies are doing. And we see that change very soon. Uh, the other thing I also look at is, is pulling the future forward and not expect to go in 2022 or 2023 and rather, I think it's time that they need to pull the future forward and be a little more tech driven. Uh, something what I've seen in my country where uh, Prime Minister Modi, and it was in the papers yesterday, he is giving enough incentives to company who are willing to make a move from China to India to start their logistic or manufacturing companies. And he has advised the 28 chief minister to provide them with tax benefits and incentive. And I think that is something that uh, you know, America should take a cue from and also incentivize companies, not only just to manufacture here, uh, but also think through a strategy to have the supply chain from here locally. I would say that uh, Charlotte is specifically positioned well from that perspective with our geographic location, the airport, the rail lines, and the, the infrastructure that we do have in place now. So it, positions not only the U.S. but the Charlotte market as well in a good spot, uh, forward thinking. Well, Dave, I'll pick up on that in terms of forward thinking. Um, you know, reshoring is, is, is one idea that's out there um, and, and dual supply chains um, is another one. Um, but, but the other thing that's been talked about a lot is Industry 4.0 and automation. Um, and when you think about the social distancing, um, regulations that are going to be, be in effect, um, you know, robots don't have to uh, social distance, right? Um, and and there, there may be some uh, push there to, um, to automate. Um, do, do you see that happening in, in a Charlotte region? Absolutely, Chuck. It's been a, a pressing concern for the last couple of years, and I think we'll see just a bigger increase in that overall. There was a good article that just came out in a publication called Automation World by an author named Aaron Hand. A very good article about uh, how COVID-19 and this pandemic will change and push forward all of this technology into the manufacturing sector uh, and how that we'll even see a, a large backlog for companies that want this automation and if they're not thinking about it yet they're already a little bit behind the curve so uh, hopefully anyone that is going to listen to this program will start thinking uh, to look to those automation projects and see what they can do in their plants moving forward. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing that as well. I mean, we're definitely seeing, you know, with all the social distancing and with the travel hold and everything, that companies are more and more talking about how quickly can we get to the point of automation. We've been talking about it, we've started it, but what can we do now and how can we make this happen? And I think, I think a lot of times when people hear automation, um, they think, about job loss, uh, but what types of jobs might be created through automation as well? There's really a host, anything from you know, the automation engineering, the techs, the maintenance, the supply chain. There's a lot of skilled and non-skilled workers that do go into the support for these. So there's short term, both the implementation of the projects and then once those lines are in place. And just to add to that point, what Dave just mentioned, that yes, you are right, Chuck, when you say that there will be a possible loss of human capital there, and that could be for the low-skilled manufacturing workers, but then again, uh, any kind of disruption has their flip side as well. And what we see that uh, demand for high-tech savvy uh, engineers, artificial learning, artificial intelligence, and, and most of the jobs that we are filling as of today, probably they may not even exist in 15, 20 years down the line. Uh, just for an example, I think in the 90s, nobody would have heard of something called an audio engineer. And, and, and today, all we do is we either talk to Alexa or Google Home, and we are just utilizing audio engineers. So looks like that automation is going to bring up those kind of jobs probably that we, you and I don't know right now. 
And I would say too, healthy companies, they're either hiring or acquiring. And when people aren't seeing either one of those, they get nervous. But with automation, companies can do something else. And one of the things they can do is they can grow the people inside their company and help them develop into different skills, new skill set. And so if you're not hiring or you're not acquiring, then you need to grow your capital within because it's the same budget. So I think there is opportunity. This pause is going to cause opportunity for companies to grow within. That's a great point. I, I think that's a, that's a great point to, to close on too, looking, looking toward the future. Um, closing thoughts on that in terms of you know, what, what should companies and also people be doing now to take advantage of, of this time uh, to reskill when you're looking toward the future? I think uh, <clears throat> I think that this has been a really cool time for companies. I, I've seen a lot of innovation, even watching companies and how they address communication and how they're working with their workforce and how they're bringing their workforce back safely. Um, so I think um, it's causing companies to go ahead and take a look and say, what does our future look like? And I think the points that some of the rest of the guys talked about regarding automation, I think we're already beginning to see some of that happen as they look at a line and they say, All right, how do we create separation on a line, for example? And uh, it points out to the engineering of how do we make this work and how do we reduce the number of people working together. And, and back to what your original question was, I, I think there is job loss, but I think we're going to gain a lot of higher paying jobs. And, and listen, Charlotte could be, we already have a couple good technology companies in Charlotte. We just build on that and attract those companies innovating into Charlotte. So we're building that technology. It's one of the big advantages of this region is we have uh, we have the tech, we have the finance, we also have this base of uh, advanced manufacturers uh, exactly. surrounding the region, and I think that intersection can be very powerful going forward. That's exactly right. Uh, Dave, Ranjit, you know, I just wanted to give you a chance to close. Sorry. Oh yeah, so uh, I really think that you know COVID nineteen with everything negativity that's around, but it has also been a catalyst for a numerous system and. And in, in a way that it has questioned the status quo of, of the way that we think about doing our day-to-day -day business. You know, I never thought that I would be in a panel and discussing about this virtually and look at the technology that we are using today. Uh, who thought that, I, I live in South Carolina and the schools are off for the entire, entire year. And so it, it makes us really questions hard that is it really required that you need to have a classroom in order to get learned or you know, get educated? Uh, do we really need to have a face-to-face -face meeting as such, or we can do it viral? Uh, so I've seen companies, you know, when they talk about, and there are some companies that I'm talking to, and they're saying that instead of having the traditional one, two, or three shift for manufacturing company, why not have multiple shift of two hours or three hours each? So instead of housing, and because of the manufacturing line where people need to be in close proximity, instead of housing 40 people, let's have uh, divide those three shift into six shift and have just 20 people and maintain that social distancing line. Uh, change the definition of work week. Uh, maybe some people may work from Monday to Friday, another person may work from Tuesday to Saturday or Wednesday to Sunday. So people are getting creative. People are, uh, and, and as you know, the show must go on, you know, human being have survived so many things. And I think this is just one of those uh, passing, pa passing uh, thing. And I'll continue that thought in my close. I'm always, uh, glass half full kind of guy myself. And there's no denying it's a very scary time. It's been scary. I get it from a, a company perspective. You're worried about so many things, paying your employees, keeping the company going. It's sometimes hard to look towards the future, but this really is an exciting time to make some shifts and to really see what roles can be utilized more effectively, what automation can be brought in to make things better. And so short term, yes, it can be a little scary, but the long term, this is exciting and it can be a really good thing for the U.S. economy, the Charlotte economy and everything across the board. And I think, too, I think I'm drinking from the same glass. I don't know if we should, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I would like to say that, you know, I think we've all had muscle atrophy, you know, how to manage a remote workforce. And now I think we're flexing that muscle. We're getting really good at it. And I'm seeing some really cool things like um, engineers where you thought R&D had to happen in a lab. I'm seeing engineers printing, using 3D printers at home now. Some really cool stuff. Um, things that you never thought could happen. So um, it's been very interesting um, to me. 
And also, you know, from a perspective, I just want to close with this, from a communication perspective for manufacturing facilities, you know, I think it's important that when you message your, your organization that um, you're unique and, and, you know, that there's clarity in your message, you know, are you hiring, are you acquiring, or are you going to grow within, and that you definitely show empathy, you know, in your communication with your workforce. Um, and that's relatable. And then I think most of all, I think that you should show your workforce a proven path forward. So if you're not acquiring, if you're not hiring, show them what's, you know, what's happening within and what you're willing to do for them. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Well, great. This has been a, a, a rare uh, forward looking and optimistic conversation. And uh, as Ranjay said, the show must go on and we'll look forward to, to new opportunities and uh, uh, new potential in the, in the Charlotte region's uh, manufacturing space. So thank you, Michelle Fish, Dave Holtzman, Herb Dew, and Ranjay Sarda for joining us today. Stay well. Pleasure.